Hello, welcome to Lost in Sci-Fi and Fantasy. I'm your host, Leo, and today we are talking about Sphere, both the book and the movie. Now, as I've stated previously, um, this is kind of accidentally become a Michael Crichton month, and this is tying that up with a nice little bow, because Sphere just kind of so happened to coincide with the 30th anniversary of Jurassic Park and me accidentally doing Westworld before coming to the realization that Jurassic Park was having its 30th anniversary, that, you know, things just kind of just meshed decently well. So I decided to do the book as normal and to actually, you know, help fill out the episode a bit, do the movie as well. So as a kind of consequence, I don't really have a challenge update this week because the challenge update is Sphere, uh, and I decided to kind of make it part of the main episode. Let's just say there's there's a lot to talk about. Uh <laughs> It It's very confusing for me. I've been thinking on and off how I'm going to even talk about this episode. You know, talk about the subject matter of this episode. It's not easy. I'll, I'll tell you that. So, so let's kind of start with probably the shortest section. That's going to be uh, my history. I don't really have a history with this. I, I bought the book at Target at random one time because I was like, ooh, they have some Michael Crichton books. Let me get some. I believe it was to celebrate the release of Dragon Teeth, uh, which is one of Michael Crichton's post-mortem books. And I decided, oh yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get these books. I think I got that and State of Fear and maybe next. I don't know. I've gotten next a couple of times. It, it's, <laughs> it's a bit of a mess. It might have been Timeline, actually, that I got instead but anywho so i picked up sphere and i was like yes cool i don't know what this is and it's just been kind of sitting on my shelf for ages then i decided at random to add it to the challenge i was going through the books that i had in my room and i decided you know what i'll i'll take sphere and i'll add it as one of the spacer books you know because i wanted the spacer books to be books that i've had for a while that I just hadn't gotten around to. And of course the first one was uh, Shadows of the Empire. And I hated it and vetoed it. This book I don't hate. But I don't love it. I, I will say that. Uh, I, I finished it all the way through. And it just left me fucking baffled. I will say that. As for the movie. I I decided you know. Since I'm doing the book I need something else. I, so I'll, I'll get the movie. So I went hunting out for the movie. Uh, got it for like five bucks, or actually I think it was four bucks, and boom, now now I own it. <laughs> so some breaking down this plot is going to be difficult. I guess the best way to go through this is is to kind of I guess start with the book, and then we'll talk about the movie and how they're similar, how they're different, uh, and go from there. In case you're curious and, and wondering, in case you're curious. I finished the book and the movie today, uh, the day I'm recording this. Well, kind of. So I, I finished the book about the time that my short went up, talking about how I finished the book and we were moving on to the next thing. I was planning on watching the movie the next day, but I decided, you know, I'll just watch it tonight uh, and record the episode. It is currently like 3.30 in the morning because, again, as I said previously, my sleep schedule is a garbage. But we're here now, so we're just going to kind of roll with it. I felt that this book was overall very interesting. It goes in so many different directions so fast that you just, you kind of are sitting there with shell shock wondering how the hell did we get here? Before we get into that, let us go ahead and look at the book blurbs because I felt, I, I brought the book with me uh, to record because I felt might as well. So we will look at these little blurbs. Now, for some for some context, this book was the book immediately prior to him releasing Jurassic Park, but it actually has a similar feeling to both Andromeda Strain and Jurassic Park together, but then goes completely off the rails, as I said. So the basic description that the book itself gives is, In the middle of the South Pacific, a thousand feet below the surface of the water, a huge vessel is discovered resting on the ocean's floor. It is a spaceship of phenomenal dimensions, apparently undamaged by its fall in the sky, and most startling, it appears to be at least 300 years old. But even more fantastic and frightening, 
is what's inside. Now, the little uh, review things, review blurbs, uh, the Los Angeles Times says, Crichton keeps us guessing at every turn in his best work since the Andromeda strain. Uh, the Sunday Oregonian said, A creepy, futuristic tale. Newsweek said, A page-turner with oomph. Crichton's writing is cinematic with powerful visual images and non-stop action. This book should come with hot buttered popcorn. I, I disagree with that because I don't condone reading with messy snacks in general. <laughs> Crichton's thriller is a Chinese puzzle of a book, each solution leading inexorably to yet another mystery, plausible and compelling. That's the San Diego Union Tribune. Sphere may be Crichton's best novel, but even if it ranked only second or third, it would be a must for suspense fans. That's the Miami Herald. And then I think there's more on the inside. Yeah, Los Angeles Times, Orlando, Sentinel. The Associated Press just says chilling tension. Then there's one from the from Christian Science Monitor. I have no clue who the hell they are, but uh, it says, Fascinating. Crichton provides a fast-moving, suspenseful, suspenseful plot. And for the most part, I do agree with most of these, again, save for the hot buttered popcorn bit. But this, this it's an interesting book, but it, it goes in so many directions. So, for context, the book opens following our, our main character, Norman Johnson. Now, he is a psychologist. You know, he's he's part of a emergency, like, team that comes together whenever there's, like, a plane crash. And he is supposed to go, if there's survivors, to help them kind of work through the trauma that they literally just endured. And hopefully help, you know, survivor syndrome, or survivor's guilt, that's what it's called. And he, he tries to help curb that. And his specialty is in anxiety. He has been summoned by the Navy uh, for what he believes to be a downed airplane. He arrives and is told promptly um, it was a spaceship. And he's like, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. So that's why the, all the secrecy for like coming out here. Okay, I get it. And then the captain, Captain Barnes, I believe his name is Captain Harold Barnes, says... It's 300 years old, at least. And th that kind of takes a moment for for Norman to register. But then Captain Barnes kind of slides in with the... Here's this paper that you wrote. Do you remember it? And Norman goes, yeah, I do. It's a paper on the procedures on contact with an extraterrestrial life form. And it goes through his entire writing process, what he was thinking at the time, and whatnot. And it shows that he he did it because he, he needed to pay for a house. He, he was having trouble not knowing if he was going to get tenure, and he needed to buy a new house for his family. So he, he needed the money, so he agreed to write the paper. Uh, write it, he did. Pretty much he went from person to person during these meetings... And just put what they wanted in the paper. Because they would say, do you know anything about this? And he would say, no. Well, you need to put it in the paper. He's like, okay. So he puts it in the paper. Then he recommends kind of how they should handle it. What the team composition should be. And recommendations for who should be on the team. And he finds out that all except for one of those recommendations were listened to. Technically all except for two of those recommendations. So he... He wanted a mathematician, because that's the potential common language. He wanted a zoologist, you know, slash uh, biochemist to be able to, you know, work on any potential uh, life form. Uh, he wanted a psychologist, but not him, uh, to, to be part of it for team, to observe the team. Uh, he wanted an archaeologist, and that's the team, actually. But the Navy replaced the archaeologist with a marine biologist because this one crash-landed in the ocean. So they needed a marine biologist. Oh, wait. Uh, and then they needed an astrophysicist. That's the other one. It was a team of five. Uh, the marine biologist chickens out. He, he can't... He, he ironically has a fear of the ocean, and he hates 
he hates the ocean, but he's a marine biologist. So that that's kind of fun. But he chickens out. He starts going down in the sub and says not nah, and goes back. And then Norman is technically the second one because the person that he recommended for the job was busy, I think. And then everyone else on the list was, you know, not available or dying. And so we get to the kind of mysteries because it turns out that this spaceship is not an alien spaceship. It's an American spaceship. So the spaceship time traveled. They find this out when they are investigating the door. Now, Barnes was implying that he didn't know where the door was, but in fact, he did. That's the reason why they were called there, is because they knew that there was a door, and they knew where it was. And But he withheld that information. Not only did he withhold that information, but he withheld the information that Norman was the last choice. And then he eventually withholds the information that he, he trapped them down there. Uh, Captain Barnes traps them down there because... There's a storm brewing on the surface, and they're supposed to get out. But Captain Barnes gives them the false pretense of a choice by offering to let them go and having them vote for it. But, oops, they get they get stuck. And Barnes has already sent out a message saying that they're all going to stay and stick it out. But, yeah, whoops. But anywho, so they find out that it's an American spacecraft when they go to open the door. And there's a panel, and the panel gets opened, but they they can't quite push the button, so they have to send the team out, and the team looks at the thing and sees that it's in English. The buttons are in English. So they open the door, and they go in, and they, yeah, they just find that it's an American spaceship from at least 2043. And technically, it actually properly launched and was on its mission around 2057. So it is a kind of deep space spaceship that the Americans, I guess, used to try to, you know, travel. And they went into a black hole, came out, it appeared on Earth. Like I said, it, it's, it starts going a bit crazy. From there, they explore the ship and they find a sphere. Uh, the description in the book is that it is a big silver sphere that is, like, perfect. It's like a perfect sphere, save for there's like a tiny groove denoting a potential door, meaning that you could theoretically go inside it, but they, they can't open it. So they set up monitors around and everything, and they, they just hang out. Norman, while just kind of puttering about, he he goes to eat some coconut cake, uh, but then sees through a monitor another monitor that for some reason this monitor is in the kitchen. It's not really explained why. But he sees Beth and one of the Navy people talking behind them as they're talking about the sphere and how it might open. It opens on the screen. And he rushes back, tells them that it was open, but it's closed, of course, when he gets there. As they're trying to figure it out, Harry seems to figure it out, who is the mathematician. Uh... He figures it out and just leaves on his own, opens the door on the sphere, and goes in. Three hours later, he pops back out. They bring him back, and he's, he's like, knocked out. His attitude's changed, and things are starting to go weird. Things that weren't there before, at least that they believed, suddenly are. Things start happening randomly. For example, um, the seafloor that they were exploring because it's a thousand feet down, didn't really have any life. So they, you know, they, they found that a bit odd, but they're like, oh, you know, it's a thousand feet down. Then suddenly, sea fans started appearing, and then squid, and shrimp, and then jellyfish. Now, the shrimp and squid, uh, Beth, the zoologist, starts to examine. She's, she's noticing that things aren't quite right with these. But, but Norman kind of just chucks it down to like she's tired in fact that's kind of a reoccurring theme throughout this book is the mention of people being tired and you know things might just be a trick of the mind as it were that maybe they just didn't notice it before because they're tired that kind of thing and it seems according to beth at least that with the with the dissections that was the case she was just too tired the shrimp were fine 
and the squid were just anomalous, meaning that they were just a bit weird. But her whole thing was that these are technically new species of shrimp and squid that shouldn't exist. Uh, then the jellyfish. So they're all sitting around talking during dinner. One of the Navy people, the archivist, sees the, these jellyfish and wants to, wants to like, capture, uh, record them for posterity. So she goes out and starts recording them. But then the jellyfish start like clumping around her, and they kill her. And there's there's a point that's made that they can't keep bodies on the ship or in the habitat because there's no room, and it would potentially foul up their air because they don't have anywhere to store it. So they just float the body up. It just we it just goes up. Then after that, uh, weird things start happening, or more weird things. Uh, such as they start to communicate with the entity uh, that they believe is the sphere. Uh, and they get a coded message that they have to decrypt or decode. It's this whole long process in the book, but it's eventually figured out and by Harry. And he decodes it, he like handwrites it down, and it translates to... Oh, let me see if I can pull up the message. I have the book on my lap right here. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. The message takes a while. It takes them a while to get there. So there's the binary version dinner. Okay. Here's them translating. Uh, da, da. Okay. Here we go. Harry translates it to Hello. How are you? I am fine. What is your name? My name is Jerry. And there's this whole I exchange <laughs> that, well, that's a silly name for an alien. And whatnot, but eventually they're able to get it to speak, like write in English and whatnot, and they have conversations with it, though they don't really ever go anywhere. Yeah, then there's a squid attack, more people die. Oh, man, just a lot of weird stuff happens, man. Basically, a lot of the book kind of starts to break down into you aren't 100% sure what's going on. There's like a lot of mental breaks happening, a lot of weird scenarios happening all the time and you're just trying to figure out you know is the person that we're following a reliable narrator because you know he's being told that he that certain things happen but he doesn't remember them eventually and this is where spoilers come in uh of course it is found out after after everyone save for three people are dead it is found out that harry the mathematician who went into the sphere, is the one manifesting these things. He's the one that manifested the squid. Uh, he is also the one that's been communicating with them through the terminal. And uh, Norman finds this out when he personally goes to translate the message, the first message that they received, just because he was trying to go through the transcripts and try to learn more about Jerry. He goes and personally uh, translates the thing, and instead it says, hello, how are you? I'm fine. What's your name? My name's Harry. And so then there's this, you know, thing. He goes to Beth, but things are kind of very weird with Beth. And just everything gets so confusing from here on. Eventually, they're able to sedate Harry. And then they're working to try to figure things out. And then... Beth starts accusing after she goes out of the ship and starts setting explosives around. She starts accusing Norman as having gone into the sphere. And her source, her, her evidence is the jellyfish. Because after the jellyfish attack, he relates to her a story about jellyfish that he, he personally experienced. He's like, oh, you know, this reminds me of... When I was a kid, I was supposed to watch my brother, Tim, and he, and I, but I wanted to hang out with my friends at the beach, so I left him, and he got stung real bad by a jellyfish, and whenever I saw it, I feel, felt guilt, guilty. I mean, he's dead now, but, you know, I felt guilty at the time. And I, I will make a, a small aside here. 
you may you may have noticed that um, his brother's name is Tim. Uh, his son's name is also Tim, uh, uh, presumably named after his brother, at least you would think. But you might notice going through Michael Crichton's work that he tends to fall back on on the name Tim a lot. Sometimes it's it's a little bit odd actually at times, but yeah. So that that's her evidence that he is the one, at least one of the ones manifesting, because obviously Harry is confirmed to have been in the sphere, but Norman, we don't know. So Norman, he isn't con, you know, he he starts to maybe get convinced that he's maybe manifesting. He he doesn't know. He doesn't remember having gone in the sphere. He doesn't remember anything. So he 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 doesn't feel that he sh- would have gone into the sphere. But she states that there was a two-hour period of time in which he was MIA, they couldn't find him, and then he came back tired. Uh, as a response to this, in her suspicion, she wants to sedate him, but he slips away, hides on the upper levels of D-cylinder, she locks him in, and starts to remove the air from that uh, chamber, suffocating him. He's able to survive by getting an emergency can of air, climbing out the top, crawling his way through into a cylinder where the the um, suits are. And he suits up, and she's like, oh, you know, you can't get to me. If you do, I'll, I'll blow us up, kind of thing. Because she sets explosives all around the ship, but also sets some under the habitat as defense. So... But he, he's not planning on trying to go after her. He jumps down and he heads to the ship. And then he does go into the sphere. He goes into the sphere. And in there he talks to whatever. He floats around. And learns that the power was within him all along? Question mark. But he comes out and now he's able to also manifest. So presumably he hadn't gone in the sphere before. Maybe. But the sphere also kind of says that maybe he he was already there at some point because it i don't know it's very confusing so but anywho so he goes and he learns you know that she had definitely been in the sphere she's been manifesting certain things here and there changing what things look like as they're going through so he's like okay so yes yeah, so she's definitely been in the sphere Okay, so now all three of us that are currently alive have been in the sphere. But I'm the only good one with this power. So I'm gonna fucking leave. Because <laughs> the, the the storm up had been cleared. They got a message saying, all good. We'll be there eventually. But he comes out and he looks at the bombs that she set. And she he's just like fucking rips one of the cords out. Which accidentally starts the timing sequence a timer starts going and he's like oh well at least they give a these bombs have a fail safe because they're not military bombs they're construction bombs so they they make sure that there's a fail safe so people can get away thumbs up (laughs) but they still only have like 20 minutes to get out of there so he's like okay and he goes gets into the mini sub and starts to leave and he's about halfway up when he realizes Oh, oh no, I, this is why even I, I'm not good with it. Okay. So he goes back, saves Beth and Harry, and they, they leave. Up on the surface, they come to the conclusion that humanity isn't ready for this. Um, one of the reasons that, so Harry beforehand was getting a bit freaked out. And the reason that he was freaked out was because... Because the ship was built without the understanding of time travel being a thing or travel through a black hole being a thing. And the ship was built specifically in that way, you know, as like a test flight. It was very careful. That would mean that no one knew about their expedition. And so that freaked him out because initially he assumed that that meant that everyone on that mission dies. All of the information and everything dies with them. But, it turns out, uh, no, they they just will it to be forgotten. And they do. They change how the story goes. 
and everything, and then they will it to where they all forget. Save for maybe Eliz uh, well, Elizabeth or Beth, where it's kind of hinted that she probably kept the power and is the only one that actually remembers what actually happened. And that's the book. It's really weird. There's not a real proper explanation of what the sphere is or anything. It's so weird. Personally, I'm probably not going to come back to this book, at least no time soon. It'll probably be similar to maybe Terminal Man, where I might come back to it way down the line. But Terminal Man's short. This book isn't. While not the longest book in the challenge, it's still pretty hefty, coming in at 498 pages. So it's pretty pretty up there, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of length. And it comes with a nice little excerpt for Michael Crichton's Next, which I think has to do with monkeys. I don't know. I, I haven't read it. Uh, it's one of the other ones I considered putting into this along with, like, Timeline. But, yeah, it's a weird book. Now, it has some moments of poorly handled, like, uh, sexual assault and talks of sexism, racism, and whatnot. So, Beth's main character motivation is that... She wants, she feels hard done by, by society. And you know what? Fair enough. She pretty much, she was. Uh, she, while she was in college, uh, studied under a professor who liked to use his students as um, lab assistants and would pretty much take their work and publish it as his own without credit um, for them. In Beth's case, she ended up dating this professor for a period of time, and he got bored of her, decided to cut the relationship, and then he published her her findings uh, without her name on it. So she she feels betrayed there. She's also mad that she's been stuck at associate professor for who knows how long. So she has a lot of justified anger in that, but a lot of it's played off because... Um, this book was written in the 80s, so that's not great. Um, and also, she's treated as if she's hyper-emotional in comparison to the men. And I don't think that that's really right, you know? I mean, which is also a bit weird, because there's also a lot of other strong female characters in this book that, you know, aren't. Except for, technically, when, when they are conversed with... At least uh, Tina, when she's conversed with, she's one of the Navy people. She, she's, she has a very good outer shell of calm, but inside she's freaking the fuck out the entire time. So there's that. Uh, as for the the racism, there there are some terrible remarks made towards Harry. He is uh, he is an African American mathematician in the eighties, and there's talk of him overcompensating. For that fact and but yeah it handles a lot of those things quite poorly when they discuss beth and her relationship with the doctor harry pretty much says you know it's her fault beth brings up the fact that you know that's like blaming a assault victim for having been assaulted and harry pretty much says yeah sometimes you know and it's like wait what because he pretty much says, yeah, you know, you don't do that, but sometimes you have to ask, why was, she, why was she dressed like that out late at night in a bad part of town? And it's like, what the fuck, dude? Why the hell would you say that? Like, that's a bonkers fucking way to put it. And it's just, it, oh. So, I, I do say, if you want to read this book, go, tr tread carefully. Because there's, it's written in the 80s, but that doesn't necessarily excuse some of the way that things are put. And then there's also some weird-ass shit happening between Norman and Beth throughout the middle to end of the book that I have no clue what the hell's going on there. But it, oh. Anywho, let's move on to the movie. Now the movie, I'm willing to give it some praise. It does okay. It hits most of the story beats of the book and it hits them decently well it does mess up a lot of like 
basic details, like their habitat in the book is a bunch of cylinders like stuck together, which makes some sense. That's a lot easier to transport. In this, it's a bunch of big fuck off spheres. And I think it's the director or the writer was just like, well, it will make it spheres because the movie's called Sphere. And most of the movie takes place in the habitat, I guess. That's the only reason I can think about it. Uh, the casting's pretty good. I like Samuel L. Jackson as Harry. I like uh, Dennis Hoffman as Norman. Though, they changed Norman's last name. In the book, his name is Norman Johnson. And for no real reason, they named him Norman Goodman in the movie. I don't know why. Everyone else's name is the same. Why they would change just his, I don't know. They also got rid of a couple of characters merged some rearranged some of the death scenes but for the most part yeah it hits a lot of the same beats you could also tell that they had to save budget because you never actually see the squid itself the squid is like it, a reoccurring thing it appears at least three times in the book it it uh it doesn't appear visually ever in the movie you see it blip on the screen and but you like in sonar so you never actually see the squid itself. Um, so th they obviously had like budgetary issues. So they couldn't kill Ted, the astrophysicist, with the squid. That's how he dies in the book. In this, he gets pinned and then fucking fried. I will say, it also, it kept the deaths pretty, pretty similar and also fucking disgusting. I will give it that. It does really well with that. Because, <laughs> yeah, in, in the book... There's a lot of gross descriptions of the deaths, though a couple of them they kind of eh, hand wave away. Like Captain Barnes in the book, he just vanishes. Fletcher vanishes, but she leaves behind a blood streak and a boot. In the movie, Barnes gets cut in half by a door, and Fletcher... Well, Fletcher's the one that gets killed by a jellyfish in the movie for some reason. Even though they had the same character in that gets killed by the jellyfish in the movie... But they decided to have her have the cook's death from the book. Because they decided to only have two Navy people instead of the eight that they're supposed to be. Well, there's supposed to be a total of about eight to nine people, give or take, on this mission. But they, they don't. They don't have that. Actually, I think it's supposed to be... It was, I think it was supposed to be a total of ten people, but the marine biologist chickened out. And then the fifth Navy person is Captain Barnes. So, yeah. But yeah, again, it, it keeps a lot of the plot details the same. They decide to, instead of having Norman go on his like little run out to, to go into the sphere on his own, they just make it to where he did go into the sphere early. Uh, when he, he rushed off to go save, see what happened to Harry, and he ended up going inside the sphere. And so the jellyfish was him. In the book, it's assumed that the jellyfish actually wasn't him um the sea snakes were beth and the weird nebulous tornado was beth as well that happens in the book uh and the only casting i don't really like is beth uh she is cast as sharon stone in the book sorry in the movie she is played by sharon stone now sharon stone does a pretty decent job overall with what she's given uh, they change Beth's character and a lot of the character interactions uh, drastically in the movie. That's kind of one of the biggest negatives against the movie. But they also make it to where Beth isn't as buff as she is in the book. In the book, she's fucking ripped. Like, she's described as being extremely muscly. Because she decided to work out her issues by just working out. And... I'm here for it. I loved the idea of an extremely buff zoologist. And then there's also this weird theme going out throughout where she's like hinted at the end of the book that she's the one that was making herself look prettier and prettier as time went on. As for the description of why Norman ends up looking ugly at one point, it's a question. We don't know. Theoretically, Norman could have gone into the sphere at one point earlier, but I don't know. They also, like I said, the character interactions in the film are vastly different. So, in the film, they all know each other and have, like, prior relationships. 
in the book, they met like once, maybe a couple of more times here or there after the selection process. Because in the book, Norman held a bunch of interviews with a bunch of candidates for the positions because he took the paper at least ever so slightly seriously. In the movie, he didn't. He wrote like half of it and then took a bunch of speculation from sci-fi and was like here and then he decided to put in people that he knew he put beth for some reason because <laughs> so beth and his relationship is that they were doctor patient and they ended up also have maybe also doctor patient student and they had a bit of an inappropriate relationship she tried to she attempted suicide um, and she's presented as being mentally unstable throughout the whole movie for some reason. I don't know. Uh, and then Harry and Norman seem to be friends and Harry and Ted, well, seem to be in like this weird rivalry of trying to get ahead of each other. There's, they were both like child prodigies and they were just pushing ahead and trying to one up each other. It's very weird. <laughs> but yeah, so he, he pretty much like wrote the names down because he just knew the people and figured eh, it'll work out. They they won't use it. They won't read it. They don't care. And he just keeps going around telling people, yeah, I, f I faked that fucking paper. The fact that they're using it so seriously is surprising. So I'm sorry. But yeah, like, for the most part, it it's, it's pretty much very similar. Again, you don't see the squid. You don't see most things, actually. You don't see the deaths, really, except for kind of. You see... Well, you, you see... Some of the deaths kind of, kind of obscured, except for, um, Ted's death. Ted, like I said, you see him get fucking barbecued, but, and you see the aftermaths and they are quite gruesome. You don't, the, the plot again, basically is the same. He, instead of going on his little excursion to, to get the power from the sphere, he instead crawls, goes in and then finds Beth having a mental breakdown and then they all come to the conclusion that yeah we've all been in the sphere harry recognized it immediately beth was hiding it the fact that she did it she did it similarly in the book presumably while um norman was trying to reset um the the mini sub they, they come to the conclusion that they they all probably have the power they go to the mini sub and they start having this weird situation where they get into the sub but then they're having trouble like actually using the sub because they keep teleporting in and around the ship. But at the same time, they aren't teleporting in and around the ship. They're still in the mini sub, but something or someone is trying to stop them from doing it. But then they just hit the button, go up and, and then they all forget. They all decide to forget. It's not hinted that any of them decided to remember um, the weirdest thing is that the sphere, still, I guess, intact, just floats up and rockets into the sky in the middle of the ocean in front of a bunch of Navy people. They all see the sphere go up from the ocean and into the sky, and I guess they just choose to ignore it. <laughs> the movie ends very weirdly in comparison to the book. In the book, you know, there's like a little bit of ambiguity as to, you know, did she uh, actually forget? Probably not. In this, it's like, yeah, they probably all decided to forget, but they didn't plan the, the you know, new story that they did in the book. In, in the book, they decide to fabricate a story that will overwrite the original, you know, what actually happened. And it's that... There was a leak, it fucked up the air, everyone suffocated except for them because they were in the mini-sub resetting it. And they were able to change it to where, like, the tapes confirm and everything. And you can also tell in the book that each of their, like, qualms about what they should or shouldn't include uh, kind of sticks slightly. Like, Harry in the book was worried, like, maybe we should talk about the squid. And they're like, no, keep it simple. So when they come back, one of the military guys is like, are you guys ready to talk? Because, like, in one of your guys' reports, uh, Harry said that there was a squid, but the tapes don't show that there being a squid. And then they're like, no, no squid. But, yeah, it's so weird. Uh, I actually don't think I would recommend this movie because it's it's weird. 
It follows the book quite closely, but changes enough to make it awkward, and it has a relatively short run time. I mean, it's two hours and 15 minutes, but it rushes through the story. I mean, to be fair, the book jumps around constantly and makes you feel like your brain's melting at points, but at least it's an interesting read, I guess. This, it makes the movie feel like a jumbled mess, sadly. But, yeah. But, yeah, that, that's it. I, I wouldn't recommend the movie. I would recommend the book as long as, like, you're prepped for the problematic bits. In other sphere news, according to an article from a couple of years ago, so I'm not entirely sure if it's still happening. I believe it was back in 2020. HBO was intending to make Sphere into a TV series. There have not been any updated articles since, so I don't know whether or not they would. I don't think that they should. The idea is that they had such a success with uh, with Westworld, turning it into a successful franchise and TV series, that they might be able to do the same with this. In fact, the, um, the showrunners of Westworld were on board to produce the Sphere TV series. I don't think they should. This book, the book as it is, is very weird. It's technically quite slow in the first half as they're getting settled in and getting exposed to the environment and whatnot and exploring the ship. But then it hits a breaking point where it's just rushed to the end. And either that would be one singular episode or it would have to be a bunch of multiple episodes where there's just a bunch of weird tension and people dying. Um, and I don't know how well that would work. I don't know. And then you... you I don't think you could do a sequel series, like a second season or anything. I, I just don't see it working very well. Unless you go with the same ending as the book, where it's kind of ambiguous whether or not Beth has the power still. And then you make it to where she does. And she's using it outside, and maybe the sphere comes back. I don't know. It's not for me to figure out. Um, and it might not be for them to figure out, because, like I said, that article was written in 2020. And there has been no news about it since. It might have been quietly swept away in the HBO Discovery, Warner Discovery um, merger. Like like technically Westworld was. Because Westworld was cancelled after its fourth season. When they had planned a fifth, they were approved for a fifth. And they were, it was going to be the last season. <laughs> but then they were like, nah, you're done now. So, at that time, it might have been swept under the rug. I'm not sure. But, honestly, if there was a series, I would watch it just out of curiosity, see how it is. But overall, I don't think it would work terribly well. Anywho, though, with that, I will go ahead and say that this episode is done. Yeah. I will, real quick, though, mention, since... Though there wasn't a challenge update this week, the challenge, of course, still goes on. We are beginning the Kane Chronicles, and part of the reason that I decided to record this so late at night and watch the movie and everything was so that I would have, one, some time to do other things besides read, and two, so that I could start the Kane Chronicles and with, with a fresh, clean slate, because... I didn't want to start the Kane Chronicles until I had this episode recorded, just so that I had all the bonkers shit um, still in my mind, fresh in my mind. I will admit, though, I have left out a lot of stuff. I skipped over a lot of stuff. There's still a bunch of stuff just about that. If you guys are inclined to read, you will find out. It's so weird. It's like a weird psychological thing. And yeah, but I, I wanted to have this kind of clean slate so I can go into the Kane Chronicles fresh and not have to worry about needing to remember Sphere. So, there's that. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and leave it there. I don't know what we're going to be talking about next week. I think I'll go ahead and do a from memory discussion on Shazam! Fury of the Gods, I think. And then for the challenge, we'll be talking about uh, Kane Chronicles, the Red Pyramid. And maybe... The first Trials of Apollo book. We'll see. We'll see how fast I'm able to read this stuff. Anywho, 
Thank you guys so much for listening. If you guys enjoy this, feel free to, you know, follow it. If uh, you're listening to it on one of your podcast catchers of choice or like, comment and subscribe. If you're listening on YouTube, feel free to share too. You know, let's get those, let's get those uh, metrics pumping, I guess. Uh, Anyway, thank you guys so much for joining me. I'll talk to you guys later. Goodbye.